there's a possibility that one of the questions you're asking yourself is, is a specific person a narcissist, be it a partner, a parent, or a colleague or a friend? You're probably not going to like this, but I would suggest that you can't really get an answer to that question. But there's a much more constructive way to approach this, and I'd like to share that with you as this might dispel a lot of misunderstandings and a lot of confusion. First of all, we should really ask the question, what even is a narcissist? We use the word all the time, and I haven't really seen it defined in a very helpful way. A narcissist basically is just a category of person. What I mean by that is, let's imagine we take a hundred people where all of us pretty much agree that these people are toxic, and we observe simply what they have in common. How do they behave? What are the commonalities in terms of behavior, in terms of how they interact with others, in terms of how they deal with frustration, for instance? And when we put them all together and we look at the commonalities, this helps us create some kind of model, some mega narcissist, if you will, someone who has got all of the most toxic traits of all of these people. Now, one of the biggest misunderstandings people have is that they will wonder, this specific person whom I know, is it the same as the category? And normally, if you try doing this, you will realize that it never is exactly 100% the same. And of course it isn't, because this is a model based on multiple individuals. Now, I spoke about someone being toxic. Let's see exactly what we mean by this. Let's take one random person, and we observe the person, and we try to understand if they are toxic. There are two things which we can observe, and there's one thing which we can't observe. The one we can't observe is the thoughts, that is understanding how the person is in their head. This would only be possible to observe if we were telepaths, if we can actually project ourselves into someone's head. So when someone will say, I know this person is a narcissist, they basically are saying, I am a telepath, I can see inside that person's mind, and I have 100% certainty that the person is a narcissist. If this is the case and someone claims to be a telepath, ask them what you had for breakfast on Tuesday last week. Probably you won't remember yourself, and unless they had breakfast with you, they're probably going to get it wrong. If they are not telepaths and they are claiming to be telepaths, that might just be a red flag of someone who has at least one of the toxic traits. So if we can't see inside someone's head to know for sure if they are a narcissist, what can we do? We can observe on the one hand what they say, and we can observe how they act. Now, in both cases, there are three ways they can be saying things or acting. One of them is neutral. That's either the way they talk or the way they act. One of them would be positive or pleasant, both in actions and in words. And the last one would be toxic, both in actions or in words. What's important to remember here is if we observe the actions and we observe the words, to what extent do they match? The words can be mean, you're a horrible person, things are terrible. It could also be, I want to be doing X, Y, Z. I want to start running a marathon. I want to. I promise I will. Important to observe both of them. If they make a promise about the future, do the actions follow? The promises might be nice, but if the actions don't follow, then forget about having expectations, because simply the promises are not followed by the actions that you are led to expect, and that's another toxic trait. If we observe someone says one toxic thing, they might be a bit mean, they might have an unpleasant tone, or if they do something that's not very nice to us, well, this is one instance of something being toxic. It's only one indication. It doesn't mean that they are a narcissist. So instead, what we do is we observe a whole cluster of behaviors. We observe many occurrences and we can start mapping it out. I think the most helpful way to view this is simply to observe, on the one hand, the intensity of the behaviors, and on the other hand, we observe the frequency of the behaviors. And we can break each of these down into three categories, low, medium, and high. If we look at the intersections, we can see that some people have a low frequency of toxic behaviors and a low intensity of toxic behaviors, and I'd suggest that this is pretty much everyone. All of us are sometimes a little bit toxic because we've got blind spots, because sometimes we're a bit selfish, because we don't think of others, they're unforeseen consequences. I'd suggest that this roughly is a normal situation to be in. The healthy people, of course, are trying to be less intensely toxic and to be less frequently toxic. 
So if someone points out to you, you know, when you said this, it wasn't really cool. That's not the right way to do it. Are you reacting by saying, you're an idiot, I'm going to attack you and I'm going to destroy you? Or are you going, yeah, maybe you got a point. I apologize, I'm sorry. Or do you sometimes go, you know what? I'm thinking about it, I'm considering, I don't think that putting my foot down was really the wrong thing to do. Maybe I got a bit overnight at the fact you were late, and maybe it was a bit too intense, but still, it's not cool to be late. It's important for me, so, you know, there's sort of a mixed bag reaction. So are people trying to make it lower, or are people trying to make it higher? Or are they moving in that direction? So the first category, low, low. Second category, low frequency, medium intensity. Here, we start to get a bit of a question mark. Is it okay for you to be with someone who has medium intensity of toxicity, even if it's low frequency? I can't answer for you. That's up to you to make up your mind. How about someone who has a medium frequency of toxicity and the toxicity is always low? Well, I can't decide for you. You decide if it works. When we get into these categories of medium low, then we can start asking questions because that's already making it pretty difficult. And main question is, what direction are we going in? But then we get into the categories where we have high frequency and low intensity, and that's terrible. That's often the passive aggressive, always chipping away at someone that is really difficult to work with and to live with because that doesn't usually die down. People enjoy it. I've done videos about people who enjoyed it. Seriously, it's a nightmare. Then you have people who have the low frequency but high intensity. All of a sudden, they erupt and it is awful. That also is pretty bad. And then you've got the people who have medium frequency, medium intensity. I'd suggest that that is also pretty difficult to live with. Again, if it works for you, great, good luck. But this should make it easier for you to look at these categories and decide what are you actually experiencing. But then we've got three more boxes. We've got the medium frequency and high intensity. I'd suggest that's really bad. We have the high frequency, medium intensity, same thing. And then we have the high frequency, high intensity of toxic behaviors. If you're in there, good luck. Like I mentioned, the starting point is one thing, and then the direction of the drift is something else. For example, in a video, I spoke about someone who was 45 minutes late to a brunch, to a breakfast, and with one of our common friends, we were talking about him, and we said, it's weird. When we started knowing him, he was in the low frequency, low intensity box. We didn't use these words, but this is what we meant. And over time, he has just been going towards high frequency, high intensity, to the point that every single interaction with him was unpleasant. Every single time there was drama, every single time he was making things terrible. And the only reason why you put up with him was because once upon a time, many years ago, he was a nice chap to be around. But now, absolutely, absolutely awful. Because of the direction, and because there was no reason for things to get any better, it made it significantly easier just to jettison him and just let go. So, how do we recognize what the toxic behaviors are? Well, I suggest we go back to the model, and we see in our model of how this toxic super being is, what exactly are the behaviors that seem to, to come on a regular basis? What are the words that they seem to use? Once we recognize these, and we're dealing with a new person, it makes it easy to say, hmm, I'm recognizing some toxic behaviors here. Now, I can plot to see how intense it is or how frequent it is, but the real question is, to what extent is this working for me? If I'm okay with it, I'm okay with it. If I'm not okay with it, I'm not okay with it. If I'm not okay with it, to what extent is it gonna change? Now, it could be that one person's toxicity is someone else's healthy behavior. That might be the case, who cares? Who's gonna decide? who the toxic person is. Well, I'd suggest the person's friends and family and see if they actually have any friends who stick around. And if it doesn't work for you, you're under no obligation to keep this person in your life. And so the real barometer is simply you, how you feel about these things. Use these models to identify the patterns and the behaviors. Some of them might be, for instance, how does the person deal with frustration? Do they get angry when they don't get their way? Well, in that case, if they get angry, that's one of the toxic behaviors. Do they claim they can read minds and they can tell you who the narcissist is? Well, that's another one. 
And what happens when someone says the only acceptable interpretation is the worst possible interpretation? Well, here we clearly have someone who's using an ultra-toxic thought structure. When people constantly use ultra-toxic thought structures, that affects the way they behave. When someone is always late, when someone is always fighting, when someone is always creating problems, that is the way that they behave. So if you see this toxicity that is constant and consistent, and they don't seem to want to change anything, you have a pretty clear indication of how they will be acting in the future and just see if that works for you. Now, because I know that everybody wants to have some sort of peace of mind when it comes to understanding if the person is toxic or not toxic, what I simply suggest doing is you take the model of toxicity, the pure model, you look at this other person and you compare the two and you simply see which behaviors actually are the ones that match. The ones that don't match, you can simply put them aside, ignore them, and then you look at the ones that do match. And once you see the ones that do match, you just go, well, this person exhibits these toxic behaviors, doesn't work for me. That's pretty much it. You don't have to go much further than that. If you identify the toxic behaviors, and you can then start plotting it in terms of where they are, in terms of frequency and intensity, you get a pretty clear map of who you're dealing with. When someone lies consistently, you know they're a liar. That's that. Do you want a liar in your life? If you do, good luck. If you don't, that's it. All that matters is that you can observe what is happening around you, that you understand what you're getting yourself into and with whom, and that you don't get surprises in the future. That's why I say, is the person a narcissist? Who cares? Does their behavior work for you? Yes or no? Now, as someone pointed out, we also want peace of mind to know that we're not going crazy. And this is where the model is useful. These are the behaviors of a toxic person and a crazy person. I observe the same behaviors. Therefore, to some extent, this person is exhibiting these behaviors and it doesn't work for me. If we know that the behaviors are toxic, that's all we need to know. If we know the words are toxic, that's all we need to know. If we see the person says something and they don't follow up with actions, I want to run a marathon and I want to win a marathon, but I'm a couch potato, I'm not getting off my couch, then we know that the words are meaningless. And especially, we don't waste time and effort trying to dive into the person's mind to figure out what's going on there. This part is key because we can never be 100% clear unless we're telepaths to understand if this person actually is being toxic or if the person actually is a little angel and simply we are mistaken. But remember this, if the person is a little angel and we're being mistaken, how are they acting? On the one hand, people who drown kittens pretend to be good people, but good people don't pretend to drown kittens. So what we have to do is just look at the behaviors. We compare the behaviors that the person exhibits towards those of a toxic person, and we see how many of them match. And if we realize that a large number of them actually do match, then we know that we're dealing with somebody who is behaving like a toxic person. And if they are behaving like a toxic person, well, maybe that's who they really are.